Hi everyone, um, my name is Ellie Davis. I'm a PhD researcher at Ulster University. Um, thanks for joining me um, for this pre-recorded online talk. Um, I recently submitted my PhD, which is looking at memories and literature um, written about the home during the Troubles. And um, in this talk, I'm going to be focusing on a specific aspect of this research, which is the home as a space of resistance during the troubles. Um, so I have a I have a PowerPoint that I'm going to share. Um, I'm going to share my screen, and I will be talking over the the slides and talking you through what you can see on there. So let me just start by sharing my screen. Okay, so um, during the conflict in Northern Ireland, the home was politicised in very particular ways. The civil rights movement was, of course, formed largely around demands for fair distribution of housing. And as the state and its security forces responded with violence and some of the political struggles became more militarised, houses, streets and neighbourhoods became physically implicated in the conflict. Homes were the site of invasion, of violence, places of hiding. Homes were also sp spaces of activism and of resistance through the squatting of empty houses and flats or barricades constructed to block army and police access. And um, this is neatly summed up by Bryony Reed here on this slide. Um, because of the intimate nature of the troubles, houses have been on the front line of violent struggle. Um, she talks about how they've been the carriers of political symbols of assertions of resistance, such as flags, often the sites of inhabitants' murders, and in many places vulnerable to destruction as a result of their inhabitants' politics or religion. She ends by saying private family homes in Northern Ireland have been made full participants in the public world in ways specific to the province's history and politics. So the boundaries of the boundaries of public and private arguably are fluid in any political context and I think we are all much more aware of those fluid boundaries having spent the best part of the last year um, in the varying degrees of lockdown in our homes um, which I think has confronted us all with the importance of domestic space and how it fits in with, with other aspects of life. Um, but they were particularly unsettled in the north of Ireland during the Troubles um, so we've seen some examples in this in this quote. Bryony Reid points out some of these examples. Um, but more than this, and far less visibly, homes were and continue to be a site of physical and emotional labour, of feeding and caring for people, of political awakenings, of supporting politically active family members, of the daily psychological toll of simply living in a war zone. This is, however, something often not recognised in mainstream narratives and memories of the conflict, which can of offer oversimplified versions of events and sideline the role of women. This talk is drawing on the work I did for my PhD, which explored memories of the home during the Troubles through literary texts written during the conflict by women, and which also drew on interviews with women about their memories and experiences of the home during the Troubles. Um, in this talk, I'm looking specifically at, as, at this idea of the home as a space of resistance, and I'll be providing an overview of this theme through a kind of whistle-stop tour of some of the texts I've studied. I hope that I haven't crammed too much in, but I've tried to choose examples that are very pertinent to this theme. So I want to go back to this image on the first slide, um, which shows a mural in West Belfast, an image which some of you may be familiar with. Um, the mural depicts the breaking of the Falls Road curfew in July 1970. Um, the curfew had been imposed on this area by the British Army when violence broke out during raids of homes in the area in search of weapons. Um, as a result of the curfew, residents were unable to leave their homes to get food and provisions. And after a few days, a march was organised by the women of nearby Anderson's town to break through army lines and bring with them badly needed supplies such as bread and milk to the residents. I use this image as it is a very good visual representation of the theme of this talk. It shows how something which is associated with the domestic sphere, feeding, caring, providing, 
and is both de devalued and hidden in public discourse can be made visible and brought out onto the streets and mobilized in a show of resistance. So this is a very overt form of resistance and even though not taking place in the home itself, the home and what it symbolizes is very much a part of this mobilization. In this talk, I'm going to be looking at the different ways that domestic spaces are shown as a site of resistance in various texts written during the Troubles. My research argues that fiction and non-fiction written by women during this time uh, is well placed to represent these spaces which are often overlooked, as I've said, in more mainstream narratives. Um, so I've given a brief summary here of the ways um, that home can function in this way, which I'll unpack further throughout this talk. Um, so the home can be a resistance to oppressive forces, for example, army invasion, violence within the home. We've seen an example of this more explicit resistance um, in that first slide. Um, it can also act as resistance to unsettled conditions outside the home at a time of war. Um, through the care and stability it can, can, pro it can provide. Um, and the home as a space can also um, offer an alternative to simplified and male dominated narratives through storytelling and remembrance. So these are the texts I'll be referring to, um, some in more detail than others. The first we see here is Bernadette Devlin's um, memoir, 1969 memoir, The Price of My Soul. For the purposes of this talk, I will, will be referring to her as Bernadette Devlin, as that was a key part of her persona at the time, though, of course, she goes by Bernadette Devlin McAlisky, um now. Then there's Nell McCavity's memoir, um, non-fictional account, 1988 non-fictional account of the Derry woman of the title, Peggy Deary and her family in the Bogside during the Troubles. Uh, Only the Rivers Run Free is a journalistic collection of women's accounts of the war in Northern Ireland by uh, Eileen Fairweather, Roshi McDonough and Melanie McFadden. And Deirdre Madden's 1996, 1996 one, uh, novel One by One in the Darkness, which tells the story of the women of the Quim family who are struggling with the aftermath of the brutal sectarian murder of their father and husband, Charlie, in a family home by loyalist paramilitaries. Um, as I've mentioned, the home has been a crucial site around which women have mobilised themselves politically in the North. In 1971, for example, many women were affected by the decision of the British government to recover arrears in rent and rates by taking money directly from welfare payments. And this was seen as a harsh and punitive measure and it led to a number of rent strikes um, in the nationalist community, many of which were led by women. And this is described in one chapter of Only the Rivers Run Free. Um, in the early 1980s, the Relatives Action Committee was formed by women relatives of Republican prisoners in the Mays Longkesh to support their struggle for political status. Although the RAC, which was dealt, dealt with during a recent talk by Amy Walsh on Republican feminism, and Amy deals, deals with the RAC quite extensively in her research, um, although the RAC were not organising directly in response to housing, their domestic roles as wives, mothers, sisters and daughters became the focus of their political mobilisation and subsequently a locus of resistance. One, one woman in Only the Rivers Run Free uh, talks about the actions of the RAC and other political campaigns and is quoted as saying probably the only good thing to come out of this heartbreaking war is the great change in the role of the women. With things so bad, we had to be active. And with that, we found a whole new identity for ourselves. No longer was the woman just a piece of property, your man's missus, your children's mother. As we've come more and more to the forefront, we've discovered our own strength and power. So only the Rivers Run Flea allows a space to explore the agency of these women by focusing on these these stories 
the book also details the problem of domestic violence that many women faced during the conflict, a problem heightened by war and what feminist activist Kathy Harkin called an armed patriarchy. This was an extremely difficult problem for women to tackle. In Republican communities, there were difficulties with reporting crimes to the police and in both Republican and loyalist communities, the perpetrators of such domestic violence were often public figures and perceived as heroes by the wider community. In this book, the women telling their stories is an act of resistance in itself. Army incursions into domestic space were, in, were in extremely commonplace during the troubles. Um, this is borne out on an anecdotal level by the interviews I um, undertook and also a 2007 report by the Women's Resource and Development Agency describes it as a particularly common feature in the memories of Catholic women of the conflict. Such invasions feature in all the literary texts um, under discussion and this extract which I've pulled out from Ma uh, Deirdre Madden's novel provides a description of the unease such incursions could provoke. So we describe, uh, Madden describes the, the army coming to the home to search the home and we can kind of see this sense of the pervasive presence uh, one of the children, Kate, says, "There's a sol Daddy, there's a soldier in the backyard, no more than one look. And then the soldiers come into the home and we see um, how they are taking, taken into the parlour room and how uncomfortable the family are. Emily and the children perch stiffly on the armchairs of the sofa. The, 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 one of the soldiers who was carrying a long gun is moved over towards the china cabinet. And then they can see another soldier outside of the home. So this this real sense of kind of menace and unease about this scene and about how um, such incursions um, by the army into the home can provoke. Um, so McCavity's text, uh, now McCavity's book, Peggy Deary, is the story of a working class family in the Bogside and recounts their everyday dealings with discrimination, housing, violence, criminality, par paramilitarism, poverty and death. The, the Deary's are beset by hardship and tragedy. Death and injury are commonplace, though occasionally McCavity does describe happier experiences such as weddings, parties, family dinners and nights out. The home is a crucial space throughout this book and in the following passage we get a slightly different portrayal of army incursion into domestic space which is more explicitly hostile and violent than Madden's picture. It comes from a section which describes the married life of Peggy's son Tony and his wife Lily and here there is more overt resistance to the army. One night their house was raided the police searched the kitchen and living room, one of them showing exaggerated care as he wrapped a white handkerchief around his hand before moving objects. You people are effing diseased. There are germs leaping off everything, he said. This annoyed Lily, particularly as she had just had the sofa coverings dry cleaned. She slapped the policeman's cheek. So here the house is a site of invasion as it frequently is in McCavity's text. Sharon Pickering writes specifically of the home as a site of resistance in the context of army raids in the North and describes, quote, the agency of working class women when confronted by sec security forces within their homes and their creative and enduring resistance, end quote. But the home here is also a site of domestic work and pride with the reference to Lily's dry cleaning of the sofa coverings. And in such, si in such situations, we can see the traces of what the critic Susan Freeman calls shelter writing, in which, quote, the smallest domestic endeavours have become urgent and precious in the wake of dislocation. Pickering's discussion highlights the role that such raids played in politicising women and mobilising resistance against the British state, but she highlights the tensions often present in the high standards the women had for their homes saying, ironically, at the very instance women were transforming those same traditional roles as homemaker through constant confrontation with policing, they also sought to fulfil those same traditional roles as a form of defence in the face of inevitable household invasion. 
So this is what Freeman calls the home's doubleness, uh, the way that the home can be a site of both tradition and convention and radicalism. And in this scene, domestic space is also somewhere Lily can exert some agency and fight back a little. It's a limited power, of course, but the trope of the passive woman here, uh, the passive woman victim, is subverted by Lily herself, of course, and by McCavity's recounting of the incident. The home features prominently in The Price of My Soul, Bernadette Devlin's memoir, especially in the early chapters, which focus on the backgrounds of her parents, the story of how they met, and an attention to the material conditions of their lives. Devlin details the wrangles her parents had in the town of Cookstown to break free, free from her mother's family, who disapproved of their marriage, and to set themselves up in their own home. After their marriage and a brief period of living in, quote, the servitude, unquote, of, Liz of Lizzie's mother's house, the couple finally set themselves up in a flat in Molesworth Street. This is represented as a crucial moment of self-realisation. Devlin writes, at least the Molesworth Street rooms belong to them. They paid the rent. My mother's favourite expression in life was, at least we can lock the door. The Devlins were operating in a doubly hostile environment with the widespread anti-Catholic housing discrimination in Northern Ireland, coupled with the social snobbery and ostracisation they faced from inside their own community. We can see reflected in these accounts Freeman's concept of shelter writing again and the emancipatory potential of the home. Lizzie and John's homemaking in Molesworth Street is a version of, quote, the life-affirming home, end quote, a space which doesn't, uh, which, quote, doesn't reinforce hierarchical social relations, but is pitched precisely against them, end quote. And again, that quote comes from Susan Freeman. As Devlin becomes more involved in public life and less in the domestic life of her family, she retains her interest in the everyday details of how people are fed, clothed and cared for. Her account of the famous Long March from Belfast to Derry in January 1969, for example, includes several references to where the marchers stopped for food along the way and where they slept. Even while the activists were away from their homes, there are individuals and communities along the way helping them and attempting to provide what domestic comforts they can. In Dungiven, we see uh, she tells us that women had made sandwiches, local tradesmen had given food, the priest provided cigarettes, the doctor held open surgery for blistered feet, and the municipally owned castle supplied, supplied free washing facilities. Such descriptions are part of the bigger story of how Devlin came to be who she is, how she came to hold the values she has and be part of the political struggle that she is a part of. Crucially, we can see here that like with the women who marched through the Falls Road curfew, the home is being brought outside and such care is provided in solidarity with the civil rights marchers and their cause. There were many examples of such practices throughout the troubles with women performing their caring roles both publicly and privately. And as Devlin herself emphatically points out in the 1988 documentary film Mother Island, throughout the tumult on the streets of Derry during the Battle of the Bogside, there were women continuing to provide three square meals for their family. Further instances of women's everyday political activism during the troubles includes the devising of homemade gas masks from nappies soaked in lemon juice, vinegar and water as the police attacked communities with CS gas. Eileen Doherty's conversion of her William Street flat into a makeshift cafeteria during the Battle of the Bogside and the banging of the dustbin lids to warn of the army approaching and that last um, instance has become quite a ubiquitous image, the women banging bin lids on the pavements. All these examples of protest suggest the domestic life of women but objects are brought out onto the streets used in acts of resistance and private spaces are made into explicit sites of political refuge, solidarity and support. The labour of such women though is rarely recognised or acknowledged in mainstream histories of the conflict in Ireland, even though it was, as Devlin points out in Mother Ireland, with her reference to the three square meals, vital in sustaining both political and home life during this time. <clears throat> 
Public events are reported, but the work that went on behind the scenes is not seen. Both Devlin and McCavity's books insert these experiences into the history of conflict, and Peggy Deary provides a particularly strong corrective in the sections devoted to the funeral of Peggy's son Paddy, who was killed planting a bomb for the IRA in 1987. There was a protracted high profile battle, public battle over the funeral between the Catholic Church and the Provisional IRA over whether the remains of Paddy and his colleague Eddie McSheffrey would be allowed within the precincts of the church. We can see a, a picture here of the, of the crowds at the funeral. It was very, very well attended. Um, historian Maggie Skull has written more extensively about this funeral itself, um, and, and in an upcoming book chapter she talks about the power that the presence of Paddy's widow Colette at the funeral had in the Catholic Church's decision to eventually let the funeral take place within the cathedral as was being demanded. She writes refusing entry would have been an even greater propaganda coup for the Republicans with two young widows standing by the coffins of their husbands being denied burial. McCavity's account looks behind this quote stage managed show of strength quote as McCavity calls it, and she looks at what was happening inside the Deary home. She offers us striking descriptions of the ways in which the women of the family sustained each other and their families in private. Peggy, with her trusted cooking pot, feeds Paddy's wife, Colette, who has not eaten properly for several days. And Colette's sister, Bess, washes and tongs Colette's hair in the bathroom in the midst of the wilting funeral wreaths being kept in the bath. And here is Colette's account. And I think this is a very, very striking account. <clears throat> the imagery of feeding, of, of hair being washed and tonged, and with the funeral reeds wilting in the bath. There's an amazing um, power here in contrasting the symbols of, of the sort of public funeral with the wreaths and what was happening, and the ways that these women were caring for each other in the home. Um, Peggy made me eat in the kitchen. Bess put my head into the basin and washed my hair and then she tongued my hair and blow dried it and then she did that with all the dairy women washing and drying and blow drying. So while these powerful shows of solidarity and courage amongst women can be celebrated and held up as examples of resilience and resistance at a time of war, it's important not to lose sight of the enormous toll that such work exerted on the women involved. The stress of Peggy's family life culminating in Paddy's death and the wrangles over his funeral placed enormous strain on her already failing health and several months afterwards she died. McCavity con contrasts the fanfare of Paddy's funeral with his mother's in which, quote, there were no crowds, there was no trouble of any kind. They were just the family and friends. So I'd like to end with a brief discussion of a different form of resistance that the home can offer and return to Deirdre Madden's novel One by One in the Darkness. The home's radical potential in Madden's novel is of a subtler, less visible kind than the previous examples. Here it is a place in which things are discussed, worked out, Alliances forge stories told. Madden's text, which is explicitly concerned with the processes of grieving and remembering, demonstrates the ways that literature can provide a form of memory that, in Caroline McGuinness's words, is not a mass commemorative process, but rather something difficult and complex, which does not always rise to the right stimuli and provide a uniform response. I argue that this more complex memory is enabled by its taking place in domestic space, removed from monolithic public group narratives and from the landscapes which reveal what Sarah McDowell calls, quote, both a past and present shaped and defined overwhelmingly by men, end quote. Madden's novel's domestic context allows a focus on individual characters, their subjectivity and interiority. The text's engagement with these qualities is shown in the following passage in which Emily reflects upon the conflict, the murder of her husband and the ways in which such lives get quickly forgotten in media narratives. 
and she's sitting in her home when she has these thoughts. There had been well over 3,000 people killed since the start of the Troubles and every single one of them had parents or husbands and wives and children whose lives had been wrecked. It would be written about in the paper for two days, but as soon as the funeral was over, it was as if that was the end, when it was really only the beginning. So this is crucial that this, this thought process happens uh, at, in, in Emily's home. Um, there is a space created for these kinds of reflections to take place. The details of Emily's husband Charlie's murder are revealed gradually throughout the book. And it's not until the final chapter through his daughter Helen's imaginings that we learn the specifics of how it actually happened. She thinks about her father, quote, drinking tea out of a blue mug, end quote. Two men burst in and there is, quote, the scrape of a chair, end quote, as Charlie moves and realises what's about to happen to him. Not actually being present at the scene, there is no way for Helen to know these details. Their presence in her own retelling of the story, however, underscores the role that these component parts of the home play when characters understand and process events. With this account and its specificity on, and focus on the small, Madden is contrasting her individual characters' memories with the crude and simplified media narratives of Charlie's death. Helen's imaginings create, as Jane Steele argues, quote, a more detailed, more poignant, and arguably more real narrative of the murder than the so-called facts reported in the male-dominated media. Madden's descriptions here point to a wider point about maintaining a focus on the home and how it can issue a challenge to the singular neat narratives that are imposed by certain dominant memories of the conflict. These, these memories can often emphasise public figures, heroics and elide the complex reality of daily life during the conflict. Thinking about the home as, in, as an inherently political space, integral to public life rather than separate to it, is an act of resistance in itself. And um, that's the end of my presentation itself. But just to end on a quick plug, um, if you are interested in reading a bit more about my research, um, I talk uh, more specifically about the relationship um, between the home and commemoration um, in this upcoming collection which is about women in the decade of commemorations in Ireland. Um, I'm very excited to be part of this collection, there's some fantastic women, women scholars writing uh, in the collection and exploring the role of women um, in Irish history and how that's remembered. Um, so that's forthcoming next, early next year and is published by Indiana University Press and edited by Una Forley. Um, so look out for that. Thank you very much.